everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard, Variety, Goldmine, and and other publications, welcoming you to our almost weekly, since we missed a week, talk fest, uh, things we said today, where we talk about the Beatles past, present, and to come, and whatever we can f- figure out. Let me introduce my two co-hosts from the state of Connecticut. Is it snowing there yet, Ken? Uh, it's not right now. Not right we had now. A, we had a dusting yesterday. Oh, okay. Where it, they've had a dusting of snow. <laughs> um, the host of Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. And from the state of Maine, it probably ha- does have a lot of snow, right, right yes, Alan? Yes, we have plenty. Yes, I've been okay. out there shoveling. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it fun? I don't have to shovel. Hmm. Snow. Nice. <laughs> Nice. I'll send um, you some. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our musicologist in the white state of Maine, where they had a very white Christmas, um, Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. Anyway, um, this week... We took a break for Christmas. Um, we're going to talk about uh, – we're going to do our little year-end show where we're going to talk about a few things that happened this year and what we can look forward to for next year. We're going to go through uh, – first, though, we're going to go through some news. Um, today, the day we're taping this, which is the day after Christmas, happens to be the anniversary of uh, My Sweet Lord hitting number one. Yay! Happy anniversary. Um, yeah. Both Paul and Ringo – put out uh, special Christmas statements on social media. Um, Paul put out a statement saying, Happy Chrissy to you all. Chrissy, he said, to y'all, I hope everyone has a really wonderful Christmas and has a great time with their loved ones and enjoys every minute. Love, Paul. And there was a nice little video of Paul and Nancy dancing around a Christmas tree. And then Ringo said, Peace and love and Merry Christmas to everyone. Peace and love. Um, And then Sean put up a video uh, with Yoko, and it's it's good to see Yoko uh, again. So anyway, we're gonna. Uh, there's also uh, we're gonna talk about news of the year, and of course the big story this past week that blew everybody apart is um, the reports of Ringo being knighted. We're gonna talk about that uh, when we get through the when we get into the uh, into the news, which actually will be pretty soon. But let's talk about the, the events of the year. Um, start, Ken, go ahead and run down what you thought were the big news of the, uh, big pieces of news this year. Well, for me, um, the biggest highlights, because I always consider the, the music releases the biggest events, would have to be the Flowers in the Dirt remaster and the Sgt. Pepper remaster. And I should also say the box sets, really, for both of them. And Ringo's new album, Give More Love. For me, uh, Flowers in the Dirt is one of the, the best of all the remasters uh, as far as you know what we were treated to in the box set with so much bonus material and all the Paul and Elvis stuff that was in there, two CDs of demos. One was just acoustic demos of Paul and Elvis. The other were, was uh, demos of Paul with his band at the time. Some of the songs were with Elvis Costello, and they're absolutely wonderful. I really cherish those two CDs now. I like them more and more as I listen to them. I was blown away by the acoustic demos first, and now I'm liking uh, the band demos, too. Plus, the whole packaging was was great, too, and... The uh, bonus songs that came out around the time of Flowers and Dirt, which were only available as digital downloads, which also caused a bit of a furor at the time in social media. But I'm glad that it's out there. And um, for me, that's that and the Sgt. Pepper box set are the two biggest moments of the year for me as a Beatle fan. And I love the whole box set, all the bonus material. I love how it was organized how you can have the box set with all the bonus stuff as it was recorded over two cds you know all the packaging that went into it i think it was it was done so well and um and then there's ringo cd and every couple of years ringo puts out a brand new album and they're usually very similar especially the ones post mark hudson and they all have some very strong material on them and they're all very well produced and this was very similar to those albums I liked uh, just about all the songs on Give More Love. So, um, you know, and I really love the production work that Ringo's mm-hmm. been doing with Bruce Sugar. So bright and, and everything is so well-defined. 
and I love the drumming on the new album, too. The songs are just so strong, and, and as we've said a number of times here on this show, just wish that Ringo would promote it when he does his live shows. Mm-hmm. And uh, he only did the title track for a few shows in Las Vegas. But um, I always look forward to a new album from Ringo. I like all the different collaborations of who he works with as songwriters, and this time with Steve Lukather, as well as Richard Marks and Van Dyke Parks, uh, Gary Nicholson, Gary Burr, those people, uh, Peter Frampton as well. And um, it shows growth in him as an artist when he keeps working with different people as a songwriter, and I'm just very impressed with that. So you got those. You've also got the two tours from Paul and Ringo. They've continued to put out you know, stellar concerts. They've all been sold-out shows, the ones that I went to. We've said it a million times. Paul gives you so much in his concerts, three-hour concerts. Everybody's blown away by what they see. You know, you could always talk and argue about the, the set list all you want, but he still gives you so much, so much for the money with his shows. You can't really ask for more than what he gives you uh, when you see him live. And, and all the Ringo shows are still great. And, um, and then there's a few of the books that I really like this year. The Ken Womack book on George Martin. I liked a lot, Maximum Volume. And the Bruce Spizer book on Sgt. Pepper. Those were the main highlights for me of the year as far as what's been released. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, you know, one thing that, uh, that uh, I was thinking about as you were talking, I think it's a shame that Flowers did not get nominated for a Grammy. Mm. That, I think, I, think they, um, I was l- sitting here looking at the, the nominees, and, I mean, I, I'm not going to argue about who they nominated. I mean, um, I mean, they may all be very well, you know, worth the nominations, but Flowers, I think, would have been, or or the Beatles, actually, but uh, Flowers definitely um, would have been a great album to nominate. I can't yeah. believe that, now that you mention it. Sgt. Pepper wasn't nominated. Nope. No, no Beatles, no... No McCartney, because I just did a. Let me just do a quick search here, but uh, yeah, no, no Beatles, Beatles either. But so. you know, one one thing about Flowers in the Dirt is that since I listen to radio a lot, and I know the different formats of radio, there's one that I listen to a lot, the AAA format, which is current rock mainly. It's geared towards adults. Probably an older demographic, I would say, but it also mixes some classic rock as well. And the songs that Paul did with Elvis Costello in particular would have fit so well being played on that format. In particular, when I heard, well, it's been bootlegged for many years, but 20 Fine Fingers, the acoustic demo of that, I could hear that being played on the radio. As well as Tommy's Coming Home and So Like Candy the acoustic demos of that, as well as some of the, st- the studio demos, too, with the band. And I really don't understand why, because that format of radio plays Beatles, they play some solo Beatles, they do play solo Paul, they play a decent amount of Elvis Costello. So I don't know why those songs weren't pushed. I could easily hear 20 Fine Fingers being played on the radio in that format of radio. And it's really a shame because they're so good. The sound of Paul and Elvis Costello together harmonizing and playing acoustic guitar, it would have worked so well on that format. I don't know why that wasn't played at all. My guess would be, I mean, back then probably it would have done, it would have done well. I think now, no, just no. You know, I don't think they're going to recognize that kind of a thing. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that format of radio does play some of Paul's new stuff, and they play Elvis Costello's new stuff. Mm-hmm. So that would have been the perfect format for that kind of thing. And, and, and it's not just the fact that I'm a Paul fan. They're really good songs. They sound great together. You hear their harmonies so clearly defined on these recordings It just, and stylistically, it would have worked on that format of radio. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't make sense to me. Alan, your thoughts? Or your your list? (laughs) Um, You know, I mean, pretty much my list has to be about the same as Ken's, because he covered most of what Mm -hmm. happened during the year. I mean, and when you listen to that list, it's, 
you have to realize like what an extraordinary year 2017 was for the kind of stuff that we talk about right here. I mean, Flowers yeah. in the Dirt was major and the inclusion of all those Elvis Costello and Paul McCartney demos, you know, that was a great collaboration. I thought, I wish it had gone on. I wish they had made an album, a finished album together. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but you know, this is as close as we're going to get to hearing anything like what it would have been like. I mean, apart from, sure. you know, we've, we've always been able to take all of the officially issued McCartney Costello collaborations and put them say on a, a CD and, and make, you know, the, the semi Paul and Elvis album unofficially, but, you know, it, it would have been good to hear, you know, what their further adventures were. But the Flowers in the Dirt reissue, I mean, apart from it being one of my favorite um, McCartney solo albums, you know, with all that extra stuff, incredible. The Pepper set, you know, similarly, uh, you know, it's to me, it, it's it's probably my favorite Beatles album, apart from the degree to which any Beatles album I'm listening to is my favorite at the moment. Um mm -hmm. But, you know, that was a really, you know, high watermark of achievement. And to get all of those outtakes uh, was was really extraordinary. And, uh, you know, without the monkeying around that happened on Anthology, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they've, they've taken a different approach to how they're going to do the reissues. And it's one that it, or the, the unreleased material. And I think it makes a lot more sense what they're doing now than what they had previously done. Um, right. There was a lot of debate about the remix. Um, I liked it. Generally speaking, there were, you know, a few little things that I kind of wish were done differently. And people can go back into the archives and look up that show because we talked about all this at length. Ringo's album, I really liked. I've seen a lot of uh, pro and con comments on uh, social media. Uh, there are some people who really seriously dislike it. I don't really understand that. I mean, I understand Ringo's albums are not always the greatest thing out there. and But I think he's been in a really good period, you know, since really 1989. I mean, there've been a couple of albums that weren't maybe quite as good as the ones before or after, but, but this mm -hmm. is, I think, one of the better ones. And I just love the remake of Don't Pass Me By on there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, I like the back off Boogaloo too. I think that yeah. was, that was really good. Yeah. So. Those were, you know, and the new stuff was, was, I really liked as well. You know, the, the remakes, you know, because we know the song so well, um, and and the arrangements were so, I think, inventive and and suited the song so well. I, I think they were special. But the rest of the album, all the new material, I, I thought was fine too. Um, again, people can go back and look up the show where we discuss that. Uh, right. The only thing Ken didn't mention uh, that I think you know we should at least mention, and we did discuss it pretty recently, is the Christmas album box set. Right. Um, and, you know, I, and I still think it should have come out on, on CD as well as vinyl. I mean, I, the, mm -hmm. the box is kind of cool, but I, I do think that for people who couldn't afford to pay 75 bucks for a box set of singles and who just wanted an official release of the material, even though they could have had an unofficial release all these years, I think a, a CD should have been made available. But it's kind of cool that they did it. And the fact is that at the end of every year previously, I don't know about whether we've done it on, on this show, but on, I know that on a lot of others, when people make their wish lists, the Christmas records have always been on it. So here right. they are, you know, right. um, sort of, here they are, sort of. <laughs> and do you know, and do you know, I looked on Amazon today, mm -hmm. they don't have it right now you know, the, oh, the only way you can get it is from third party vendors yeah. I'm a, I, I've have, uh, asked I've written in to see if there are more coming and hopefully there are but uh, yeah as of right now they're sold out on well, Amazon well they did say limited edition and if they're going to be taken well, they seriously say that, it's they, saying they, that. They, say that, they say that with everything and, and that's usually not the case um, I mean you can still get the mono box 
you know, so, uh, and that was supposed to be remembered. I mean, that was, that was the height. I remember when that came out, that was supposed to be limited. And I remember the, the price shot up very high at one point because everybody thought it was limited and then they, they changed their mind. I'm hoping they changed their mind with this. And I'm also hoping that they, like you, like they put out the CD because they really should. And I, and I would expect that they probably will at some point because you know just because they should yeah i don't i don't mean to dismiss the christmas messages box set there i think that it's a good thing that it came out and certainly you know anything to get the beatles name out there in the media periodically um i support and this kind of thing certainly caters to a collector and also maybe for young fans who want to discover the stuff that don't know that it's out there on bootleg anyway yeah so you know, I'm happy that it's out there, but like we've said, I just wish that it was more accessible in every format. Right. So maybe right. that will happen next year. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, as far as my picks, um, I have to give the 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 uh, number one choice to the Pepper Box, mm-hmm. only because, well, partially because it looks like, as you were saying, Alan, it's going to bring on more. It's going to bring on what we've been clamoring for for years, and that is, you know, boxes with a lot of unreleased material for each album. Um, I think that they've made that decision a little late, but I'm glad to hear that they're finally looking like they're going to do that. The the Flowers in the Dirt uh, al- uh, uh, reissue was really a high water mark. Uh, I don't know how he's going to get better than that as far as the upcoming albums. Uh, I don't even know that, you know, there's been speculation that, you know, maybe we won't see the others now. And that's a good, you know, I don't know, but we'll find, we'll obviously mm-hmm. find out. I don't there, think so, but you don't, um, you don't, you don't think so. No, but there's one thing I would like to say about the box sets for both flowers in the dirt and Sgt. Pepper. And that is that, and and I think you can maybe more so with Flowers in the Dirt than other other McCartney remasters. Mm-hmm. You really get to hear the development of these songs when you're going from the acoustic demos to the studio demos. Right. And some of the studio demos are close to what eventually came out on the actual album. They're very close, but they're just more bare. They're not fully arranged. You know, there are certain songs like um, That Day Is Done that I think was fairly close. You Want Her Too was very close to right. the version that was on the album. But it is interesting to hear the development and, you know, certain things. You know when you hear these more raw demos, the studio demos, what had to be added later for the finished, the more polished product. And well, then I there have- are fans who, who prefer it to be more demoish and more raw. Well, the, so thing, the, the, the thing he did here that he hasn't done with the other reissues is he put an extensive amount of, you know, raw tracks. We've always been complaining about the fact that the archival material on the reissues has been, you know, really skimpy. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't here. That was the good thing. And mm-hmm. maybe. And if he does continue, hopefully that will happen too. Uh, I mean, it depends on the album and whether or not there are. I mean, there are some albums that. You know, I'm not sure I'd want to hear a lot of that stuff, but in this particular case, this is one we were all hoping for. So somebody, he either heard heard the uh, you know heard the commentary or the comments from fans, or you know, he, uh, somebody told him, and I'm glad I'm glad it worked out that way. So anyway, as far as other releases go, I mean, they, you guys pretty much covered everything. Um, the R- Ringo album was good; it was, and and I'm hoping that with the upcoming year that Ringo gets a little more respect. Um, and I think we, we'll, we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, but I think that will happen. And maybe, you know, people will go back into the earlier albums and maybe he'll finally put out that compilation he's been promising. Um, so we'll see. We also had, this was a bad year and, and, and it's only going to get worse for passings. Um, uh, as far oh, as far as books go, Ken, you mentioned Ken Womack's book. That was a that was a great book. Uh, that was a, a wonderful book. Um, definitely the the Ken Womack book. That was a that was a great book. So, but we had a, an extraordinary number of 
big music passings this year. I mean, it was just, it was one shock after another. Some expected, some were not, not so surprising. Some, a couple were downright shocking. I guess the, you know, you have to start with uh, the, the, the pioneers, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, and old mu- uh, veteran musicians like Bobby Freeman and Glenn Campbell. You know, and then the big shocker, music music wise, of the year was uh, Tom Petty. I mean, that was just horrendous. That was I, I'm still encountering people saying that was just that was just a, a too hard to take. And you know, it's obviously because he was, you know, he was younger and everything, and a lot of young people relate to him. I also, want to mention David Peel. That was another passing. Most recently, though, another shocker was Pat Denisio of the Smithereens. Ken, you've talked with you've talked with Pat. You've interviewed Pat. Talk about him and the Beatles. I interviewed Pat two times, and um, one was when, well, the Smithereens, the band that he was in, uh, lead singer and songwriter for, released uh, three tribute albums to the Beatles. Uh, one was called "Meet the Smithereens." which was uh, the band covering every song from the Meet the Beatles album. Mm -hmm. And then they also did an album called B-Sides, the Beatles, in which they covered all B-Sides, but to be specific, all American B-Sides to their singles. And then in 2014, they released an album where they performed all of the songs that the Beatles did at their first concert in the U.S., at the uh, Washington Coliseum. There wasn't actually a live recording. They were studio recordings, and they enhanced it with the applause <laughs> and screaming and all that. But they did all the songs in the order as the Beatles did it. And Pat Denizio was a total joy to talk to. You can tell what a big Beatles fan he was. And, and I would highly recommend on my website, I do have uh, a page there which has – the recent one that I did in 2014, where it's all about the Beatles and his love for them, especially, and I don't want to say he he didn't care as much for the later Beatles, but when you think about these three albums, it's mainly early Beatles music. And he described the Beatles as being fearless at that time for doing what they felt like doing, always being daring, you know, going with their gut, and not necessarily going with what was expected of them. They were always that way from the very beginning, and I think Pat recognized that uh, in the group. And um, he also said to me something that I, I like to bring up every now and then as far as people that I've interviewed about the Beatles, that the early Beatles music was a lot more innovative than people give it credit for. It's not as simple as people think it is. And when you're a band that does this material, whether you're making albums or you're a cover band, and you study this as musicians, you probably recognize it a lot more than, you know, ordinary listeners who are not musicians. And so he would talk about certain things that the Beatles did on their early records that were very different. And he said it was very difficult to try to copy what the Beatles did on Meet the Beatles. It was very challenging for him vocally to sing the parts that he did. And um, he really gave you the impression that he was the guy next door. He was the type of person that you'd like to hang out with, share your record collection with, put on vinyl albums or 45s and spend an afternoon with him and just talk Beatles and and love the music with him. He really gave you that impression. And I'm sure he was that way. And um, I did the two interviews, as I said. There's a couple of clips from my first interview when Meet the Smithereens came out, and then there's the one from 2014 for the the, the faux live album. But um, if you listen to those interviews, you will really get the essence of who Pat Denizio was. The, the band really wore their hearts on their sleeves where the Beatles are concerned. And if you listen to their music, if you're fans of their music, and many Beatles fans are Smithereens fans, they really mastered the art of very catchy, very melodic pop songs with an edge to them, three, four-minute pop songs throughout all their albums, really. So in addition to that, I should also point out that he he released a solo album called This Is Pat Denizio, where he covered I Will on there, but there's an expanded version of that album that came out, which is a double CD, and there's other Beatle covers on there, too. Mm-hmm. I think he covers You Got to Hide Your Love Away. He also covers I'll Be On My Way, 
So uh, it's basically that album, This is Pat D'Anizio, is a lot of covers of 60s music. There's a few 70s songs in there, but it's mainly 60s songs. And there's a, you know, if you get the expanded one, there's something like four or five Beatle covers. So he was really nice to talk to, just a regular guy. And, uh, you know, the band themselves are really the same way, the type of guys you want to hang out with, just regular people who are big fans of the Beatles and mm -hmm. that kind of music and students of that music and 60s music. And, you know, I just... Um, what a shock <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it's between between uh pat denizio and, and of course tom petty mm. this has been you know i'm still in denial <laughs> over tom petty but uh thank, pat thank denizio, you you're not alone there i think a <laughs> lot of people are you know, it, it just uh, especially i think the shock there was i mean he had just finished the tour at the hollywood bowl and within what two weeks it, he, he was gone it was like Wow, you know that was just that was just too much. Um, yeah, he's such a vital person. He's always been a presence, mm -hmm. you know. Ever since he started in with the first album, and well, the first Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers album was nineteen seventy six, I think. Mm -hmm. So he's been a mainstay on radio all these years, right? And whether it's his classic earlier stuff or the Full Moon Fever period and the Traveling Wilburys period and everything else that followed, which got very good reviews. Um, right. He's always been there. Yeah. You know, wh whether you realize it or not, I guess it's just something that you take for granted. There's hardly a day that goes by. I listen to a lot of radio, classic rock radio, the format that I mentioned, AAA. Tom Petty's on the radio every day, and mm -hmm. I don't ever see that changing for a very long time. Because he, you know, his music has been that strong, and and uh, the Smithereens too, especially on that format that I told you, the AAA format. Right, Alan, you have any comments? No, I mean, I really, Ken had it covered. Um, I also got to know Pat Denizio a little too um, around the time of Meet the Smithereens, which I wrote about for the Times because uh, that album, in a way, changed my view about covers to some degree. I never was really a big cover guy, and I never um, really was all that interested in Beatles tribute bands, especially the ones that dressed up in different, you know, period suits and, right. and all that. But what I really liked about um, Meet the Smithereens was that they covered the album, you know, top to bottom, and they had everything right. But they also had plenty of room to sort of be the smithereens, you know, and mm. uh, and I and I had liked the smithereens, you know, before that, uh, and you know, and their, their the B sides album too. I, I I didn't catch up with the Washington Coliseum one. I have to get that uh, now, but. Um, yeah, you know, and, and and I talked to him a couple of times as well over the years, and, uh, you know, very knowledgeable, pleasant guy, you know, I mean, he knew, you, you could have a conversation with him about the Beatles, and he knew his stuff inside out, so, you know, they also did a cover of Tommy, the Tommy album, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but their own stuff was great, too, you know, I mean, you know, listen to those early Smithereens albums. It's it's very much in the in the spirit of the Beatles, but a bit more up to date. And um, and and yeah, I agree with 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 what you both said about Tom Petty too. I mean, that was a a huge shock. And uh, I don't think there really was any of his work that I didn't like. Uh, you know, I, I he was one of the relatively few, I think, current artists who whose albums I sort of actively waited for and got as soon as they came out. Um, so, yeah, he was a, a, a good creative force, and, um, I, and a, a, I think a big part of the Wilburys, not the biggest part of the Wilburys, maybe the third biggest part of the Wilburys. Hmm. But, um, yeah. So, yeah, okay. it has been a, 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 a really rough year in terms of passings, and as, as Steve said, it's obviously going to get worse because... yeah. They're getting, everybody's getting yeah. older. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a few more names that we did not mention. Arthur Yanoff, who uh, was involved with the uh, primal therapy that John and Yoko um, got into. Um, there's David Peel, 
Uh, there's Rosie Hamlin. Actually, a lot of these are John Lennon related. Uh, Rosie Hamlin of Rosie and the Originals with uh, uh, Angel Baby that John covered. Um, did I mention Glenn? I mentioned Glenn Campbell already. Uh, John mm-hmm. Hurt, John Hurt, who was in the um, McCartney Take It Away video. Take It Away video, and journalist Richie York, who probably Alan and I are the only ones that know who he is. But he was uh, he's a Canadian journalist who was wrote very extensively. If you read uh, Hit Parader back in the seventies. I'm sure you probably remember him. Uh, was he in uh, any of the others? I, I remember Hit Parader, though, Alan. I used to see a lot of his stuff in a magazine called Go. Do you remember Go magazine? Yeah, barely. barely. Go magazine was like a, a, a freebie given away at record stores. And it was mm-hmm. it was a great magazine. I mean, they must have gotten a lot of stuff on syndication, and, and that could be where they got Richie York. But um, mm-hmm. they had a lot of good writers, and they had, you know, and obviously it was a, a record industry kind of publication, so there were always great. Uh, this is going to sound silly to say that there were great ads, but I remember, I mean, there were some that I cut out and still have, and I you know, was just repacking some boxes of old stuff the other day and ran into the uh, full-page ad for Hello Goodbye, um, oh, wow. which was like the picture cover, except it was a drawing of it with stars and, you know, line drawing and stuff like that. And, and, and wow. go magazine had a full page ad of that. And I, I cut it out and still have it. Um, and, and a lot of articles I cut out from go as well. So, um, yeah, I great. remember Richie York from that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was a great journalist. Uh, um, he not only, he, he, he wrote about more than, John and Yoko, but I specifically remember his John and Yoko articles. So he did a lot with them. Uh, another one would have been um, a Ronnie um, uh, Ronnie Hawkins. I remember he I believe he wrote about Ronnie Hawkins too. So um, and actually Ronnie Hawkins had a Lennon connection there too. So uh, anyway, okay. We also need to mention Pete Shotton, who of course was a very close friend of John Lennon's early on, and he passed away uh, last year. Or this year, I'm sorry. This year, I'm already uh, this year. Yeah, I'm already. Well, actually, by the time this show comes out, it'll be pretty close to next year. But we won't go. We won't go into. We won't start doing that stuff. Uh, but yeah, he passed away in 2017. Also, so anyway. Uh, okay, now we're going to go on to the news of the year, and the big news of the year, at least as far as I'm concerned, just happened this past week. Actually, it hasn't happened yet, but the reports of Ringo getting knighted and. I think everybody that has heard this news is just really thrilled for Ringo. And, and I'm, of course, when we are taping this show, the official announcement has not been made yet. It's supposed to be made uh, on the 30th uh, on Saturday. But um, what can you say? I mean, people have – it's always been – Ringo has always kind of taken second place in front of the other three. But – the past few years, his drumming has gotten more presence on the Beatles reissues, and deservedly so. And everybody, you know, everybody down the line, his fellow drummers have always credited him with being the best drummer ever. And it's so it's really, it's really nice that he's getting honored. And why you have to wonder why the the royal family waited so long? I mean, they should have recognized his drumming talent. Uh, for the Beatles a lot sooner, but it's so it's so nice that it's happened, and I'm really happy for him. Can uh, Alan? I'll, I'm going to let you go first this time. You have anything to say? Uh, well, you know, I mean, there's not much you can say. Uh, it, it's obviously sort of an honorific, and it means more to British people than it does to us. But it is kind of cool having both of the remaining um, surviving Beatles. Uh, the Knights, um, right? And if uh, Monty Python ever remakes, you know, Holy Grail, um, since they're pals with the Pythons, they could be in there and be actual knights in the mm-hmm. cast. And there, was a, <laughs> there we um, go. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's cool. I mean, the one thing you said about the the reevaluation of Ringo's um, drumming, um, partly due to the reissues and uh, and comments by other drummers all these years. I think also another thing you have to add is uh, Mark Lewison's tune-in 
put Ringo's early career in a completely fresh perspective and, Mm -hmm. you know, showed him to be like at the time he joined the group. I mean, he was as a musician, I think the most advanced of all of them. Well, maybe not by the time he joined the group, but by say 1960, when they went to Hamburg, I mean, he was already really kind of a, a local star and, uh, not no pun intended, you know, and and recognized as an extraordinary player, and it, it's it natural that they gravitated together, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. It's just it, it's great that they. I mean, yeah. Lewis and the, your point about Lewis and though, you really pointed up how you know how big a deal it was for the Beatles to get Ringo, and I think. That helped. That I don't know if that helped in this particular case, but that has definitely brought Ringo a lot more respect. And it should. And it's. And he really deserved it. I mean, we. Re, you know, he really got overlooked in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of con- there. You still see comments about people saying, "Oh, Ringo. You know, Ringo this and Ringo that." But there's no question that he deserves the respect that he's getting now. They're absolutely. And if you go through his past work, I mean, his, his, some, you know, those, some of those songs on his past albums were just fantastic. I mean, he's always had, whereas, you know, the others have kind of gone through different phases. Ringo, for the most part, has stayed very solid, uh, as solidly rock and roll, which is, you know, which is nice. I mean, he's been very consistent. Mm -hmm. Ken, um, don't have too much to add here other than the fact that when Paul McCartney was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there was a shirt that Stella wore. <laughs> and on the front of the shirt mm-hmm. said the words that I would express at this moment, which unfortunately I can't say in the show. Sure you can. But, uh, <laughs> no, but um, I, I echo the words that uh, Alan just said. I also think that the fact that Ringo has been more of a presence out there in the media due to the fact that he's consistently been touring and a lot of people have gone to his shows and recognized what a great show it is and they're giving him more credit for that as a live performer. I mm-hmm. think that adds to it. And this whole thing about drummers giving Ringo respect has been going on for for quite a while, I think more so in recent years. I remember there was a book that came out that Max Weinberg had put out right, called The Big right. Beat, which was all different drummers praising Ringo. That, I think, was uh, the 90s, maybe the late 80s. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's always been this movement to recognize Ringo. And, and, you know, it's just very obvious that when you're dealing with a band like the Beatles and you've got two of the greatest songwriters ever in a songwriting team, and I believe the most underrated songwriter ever in George Harrison, three great songwriters there in the band that are all great musicians, you're going to be overshadowed. And Ringo, you know, only wrote a couple of songs in the Beatle years. He was not given the credit as far as contributing to the band that he deserved to. But just as a musician, he made such a difference in those recordings. He played what was right for the songs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's far more important than being flashy. And I know that there are a lot of rock fans out there that love it when musicians either wail away on the guitar or do drum solos. And that's great if that's what the songs require. Ringo did the exact same thing for Beatles songs. They didn't need drum solos. They just added whatever was necessary to make those songs better. Right. It was the whole arrangement. It was the whole picture. And Ringo understood that. And that's what a great musician does. It's not about me, me, me. It's about the collaboration altogether. And that's, well, all four Beatles are that way. So um, they understood that. So I'm glad to see Ringo getting his due here. I only wish that, you know, George and John could get something posthumously here, but they don't do that kind of thing. Yeah, that's and, what I. That's what I was. I asked somebody about that over in, that lives in in England, and and I was told, yeah, they they. I'm I'm told you, that you can get bravery knighthoods posthumously, but there's no obviously no connection to that here. But yeah, but um, yeah. Well, anyway, but it's it's good to see him. It's good to see this, definitely. Um, other big news this year, Ringo, of course, has been touring. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, you know, one of the, 
I guess one of the the um, big highlight uh, I wouldn't call it a highlight but Ringo went to Vegas right after the the big shooting there and and donated you know uh, proceeds from the concert and I thought that was really kind of nice I think he was one of the uh, I don't recall a whole lot of people doing that but it was great that he did that um, and he got a lot of acclaim for that as he should have so he toured and he's going to be touring again in the new year uh, Paul Paul is touring, and he finally, finally went to Australia. And God, I don't know how many times uh, I heard from people in Australia really angry before he decided, he announced it that he, you know, he had missed Australia for so long. And I'm glad he finally heard that uh, call from from the people in Australia. So um, and New Zealand. And New Zealand, yeah, I'm glad he finally got down there. That was that was really good. Alan, do you have anything thing to say about that? No, not really. I mean, we've 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 covered their tours, um, you know, on the show consistently uh, all along, and it's you know it's great that they're both out there, you know, doing what they love to do. Um, you know, we've talked about the pros and cons of of it in uh, in in some cases, I mean, Paul's voice, for instance. But you know what? Uh, I think everybody sort of is prepared for that now. And there's just, I don't know if it's a, a, an acoustical, psychoacoustical effect, but, you know, when you're in the hall or the stadium, it sounds better than it does on the bootleg tapes that come out for some reason. I mean, mm-hmm. I've, 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 I've witnessed that myself, you know. I mean, gone right. to hear him after his voice was beginning to fray and feeling that, you know, at that show it was just fine. And then hearing the recording and thinking, well, okay, you know, maybe I, maybe I was listening through, uh, you know, rose tinted uh, earphones or something. I don't know, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you have a good time and you're there. You hear Paul McCartney singing all of those songs that Paul McCartney is famous for singing, and you know, what do you want? So there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 another thing, getting getting back to Ringo a little bit, you know, people. You know, there are people that are uh, critical of the all-star band format, but really what that's all about, and uh, you have to give Ringo credit for that, is it's the music. I mean, he could do it completely differently, and I'm sure a lot of people wish wish that he would, but really what he's what he's doing there is saying, I just love to play. And, he's, I mean, it's really a humble – for a guy who's a Beatle – in his, you know, in his uh, stature in the music world, that's really a humble thing to do, and you have to really give him a lot of credit for that—that uh, that he's doing what he's doing. So he cares know. more about putting on a good show and having a lot of fun and pleasing people than, you know, pleasing his own artistic. Uh, what's the word? <laughs> well, it's not an ego. It's not an ego show. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah, and that's another I, way I think of that, it. I think, yeah. yeah, and I think that's what you're trying to say. Yes. It's, it's not, and that, and you have you know musicians who headline tours, um, you know, who are out on these huge stages. Look, for example, at the Rolling Stones. I mean, you know, as much as they are doing well, and I'm actually surprised that they are sounding so good as they are um still uh you know ringo is out there doing what he's doing playing small stadiums i mean the fact that you can see ringo in a you know in a relatively small place is is pretty amazing so i think there's also a a self-preservation aspect to the kind of show that he does you know i mean i've seen him a couple of times at the bottom line with the Roundheads, where, you know, mm-hmm. basically he's singing the whole show, but the show was only a little more than an hour. I think that when he decided to go out on tour in 1989, he very sensibly looked back at George's tour and said, okay, wait a minute. When I toured with the Beatles, I sang one song a night. You know, what can I sustain without ripping my voice to shreds? And 
this is the format that he came up with. Um, and I know that he thought that because I interviewed him at the time and he basically said so. Um, mm. Now, why he's maintained that till now, I mean, it, uh, he, he probably at this point, having been touring so much since 1989, he probably could sustain the whole show by himself as the lead guy. Um, well, he, and, he sound, and his voice sounds, as we've, yes. as we've discussed on the show, his voice sounds incredibly good. He'd say he's getting, I mean, there's no doubt that he's, I mean, if any musician would, would get, you know, some kind of help, there's no doubt he's getting some kind of help or he's been told how to preserve his voice. Yeah. And it's doing. He's doing a marvelous job doing it. I mean, it's it really is. It shows on the records. It shows in the live shows. Well, he you does know. songs that are not vocally demanding. He knows what he can right. do, and so there's he doesn't have to strain. Right. So it just he sounds comfortable at what he's doing. So he sounds good in the process. He does. So he does. Um, so th- I mean, that's yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm really glad, glad about it. There's uh, one news thing that uh, from the year that we forgot to mention. I don't know if. Uh, how you guys f- would feel about this, but Yoko getting credit for writing a ma- uh, writing Imagine for mm-hmm. co- the co songwriting credit. I think that's that's a pretty big deal, and I'm glad that finally happened for her. So, and another release uh, that we did not mention, the Change Begins Within DVD that finally, finally, finally came out. It was so long that uh, you know in coming. It should that should have been out years ago. And in fact, I remember talking with people back then and they it had been considered years ago but whatever took it so long to come out it finally did happen so that that's a good thing that it finally it finally came uh, Can we just mention one thing because you mentioned oh, paul in australia go ahead i just want we we the three of us would like to thank some of our listeners who actually are from australia who got to see paul live and they've written to us with reviews, and we've actually asked for that here on the show, and we will get to them in uh, maybe the next show, within the next few shows. So we really appreciate your writing to us, and we will tackle that uh, in our upcoming shows. Okay, finally, in our usual year-end mode, we're going to give a wish list. Uh, each of us are going to make uh, are going to say what we would like to see in 2018. And let me start again with Alan. Alan, go. What would you like to see? Okay, so I think the rule that we established was that we would do one Beatles thing and one from each solo Beatle. So the Beatles thing... Uh, okay, I found a way to cheat. I think, uh, <laughs> I think we know that there is going to be a White Album box set. So there's no point in saying I'm hoping for a White Album box set because I'm just going to count on that. And what I would hope for as well as a Beatles release is an interim release of some kind, you know, maybe a few months before the White Album release, where they take all the releases that happened in between Pepper and the White Album, meaning the Magical Mystery Tour material, with the obvious exception of Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, which were on the Pepper box, um, Mm -hmm. Lady Madonna and Inner Light and all that, uh, and You know, also with some outtakes or demos, Hmm. whatever, you know, just as it doesn't have to be as big a box as the White Album is going to be, but it should include remixes of those songs and that's an, that's an interesting thought yeah that's a, that's a, I, never, I, never, I never even thought about that that's an interesting little thought yeah okay good um, from Paul since we know he has a new album coming no point wishing for that because it's coming anyway so mm-hmm. I would like to see him continue with the archival series and I'd like to see an off the ground box set Um, Off the Ground doesn't get a lot of respect, and I have a feeling that a box set with some extra material and some alternate versions of some of the songs that ended up on that album might actually help change people's view of it. Um, I Hmm. I really did not think it was that bad an album when it came out. I didn't think it it was as good as people said I thought it was. (laughs) Um, because what happened was um, actually Mark Lewison was working for Paul at the time. He was um, editing Club Sandwich, and mm. he had told me when he heard it that 
his feeling at that time, and I don't think he feels the same way anymore, but his feeling at that time was that it was Paul's best work since the White Album. I don't know why he chose the White Album, but that's what he said. I went to a listening with, you know, McCartney's publicist at the time and a bunch of other journalists where they played it to us, you know, a few weeks before promos were available. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're sitting there with, you know, nothing to do or say or whatever. So I said to his publicist, you know, I heard from a friend in England who's heard the record and he said that it's Paul's best work since the White Album. And so Paul's publicist went around quoting me as saying it was the best work since the White Album. Um, and at the point I said that, I had not yet heard it. You know, this was before the listening uh, event. So, um, yeah, people began coming up, you know, saying, oh, I, you know, they're saying uh, Alan Cozen of the New York Times says it's Paul's best work since the White Album. Well, no, it's a good album. I wouldn't go that far, you know. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I, I, I did like the album, and I think that um, it deserves a reissue. From I would like to see some George Harrison archival stuff. We didn't see any in 2017. There is plenty of stuff there, you know, for various reasons. I went back to those uh, Roger Scott tapes recently that leaked mm-hmm. out years and years ago, and there's a whole right. bunch of, you know, well, maybe five or four or five of um, – George's sort of demos going down to Golders Green, Dara Dune, Gopala Krishna, and and there's the him singing on his arranging demo for Get Back for Doris Troy. So we know there's some stuff. We know that there is more first take material to if they want to keep with that theme. I think it would just be so great to hear some more of what George had going on that most people don't know about. Mm-hmm. And then there's John. Uh, you know, an awful lot of archival stuff of John's has come out. I would like to see. There is a 12 disc bootleg of just demos from 1975 to 1980. And I would like to see Yoko put out an official version of that going back to the actual source tapes, because a lot of these were taken from the Lost Lennon tapes, which um, they're very good quality, but now and then a beginning or an ending is cut off and, and that kind of thing. And, and there are undoubtedly things in that cache of demos that we haven't heard yet and you know not that this battle needs to be fought at this point but we all remember the goldman book um which basically painted john as being almost catatonic for the five years that he wasn't recording and when you make 12 discs full of demos, you're obviously not catatonic. And I, I would like an official release of that to, uh, to sort of finally put an end to you know, any thought of that being the case, because you still see people who think that Goldman's book was a good book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yep, yep. I think well, I've anyway. hit them all now, right? Uh, Ringo? Oh, Ringo. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, with Ringo's release schedule, um, I don't think we can count on a new album immediately. Um, Right. I I don't think we necessarily need another live album, although I'm not sure the current band really has been documented. And it has turned out to be his most permanent band, you know. Well, there's there's Ringo at the Ryman DVD. Oh, Ringo at the Ryman, right. That's true. So, I mean, I don't know what to expect of Ringo. Um you know, there's not. I, I'm not sure. There's a lot of unreleased archival material. Although it, he, he could finish up the Chips Moment album, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I I, I I forgot about Ringo. Hmm, hmm. Just because he's just put out an album and he doesn't do one right. year, so right. Yeah. Yeah, any you know, let's put it this way: anything he puts out would be a pleasant surprise. So, otherwise, he could take the year off and enjoy his knighthood. Okay. <laughs> Apart from touring, okay. right? <laughs> yeah. Ken, your turn. Uh, Beatles as a group, um, it, you know, I I personally think the White Album will be coming out, and I can already see 
two discs of outtakes, studio outtakes, and one whole disc of the uh, the acoustic demos in there. It just seems like it's already written, <laughs> you know, as far as how it's going to be handled. Of course, there's no official word yet. We don't know this to be absolutely true. I do think it will happen. That's what I'm hoping for. I'd be quite happy if that's what happened, what comes out uh, in November, close to the anniversary, the 50th anniversary. Uh, for John, uh, we didn't mention this yet, but there was a report in Mojo Magazine that an expanded version of Imagine is coming out in October of next year. So no details were given about it. So I would think that it's the album remastered plus alternate takes. And there have been alternate takes released commercially on the John Lennon anthology box. We also had... We witnessed rehearsals on the Give Me Some Truth DVD. And, of course, there have been bootlegs from the Lost Lennon tapes of that material. But for Mm -hmm. it to come out officially, it looks like that's what will be coming out next year. What we consistently find absolutely nothing about is the one-to-one concerts, Mm -hmm. which we, for years and years, I've been hearing that Jack Douglas has reworked them. And you never hear a comment from Jack about it. So I really wish I knew what was going on there. I personally would like to see that come out mm-hmm. because the uh, the picture quality from the old video cassette is not that good. And the audio of John Lennon Live in New York City, I thought, was pretty crummy. So you could do a wonderful job if you can in some way combine the afternoon and, and evening shows Maybe have complete shows of both. Oh, complete shows is the way to go. Complete, yeah, complete yeah. shows, absolutely. Without, um, without, I did hear from Jack Douglas, by the way. Oh, <laughs> um, but it was in 2013, you know, or 14. I, I was on a panel, and he came up and talked to some of us afterwards, and he said it was definitely happening. He was very excited about it. So. I don't know what happened. I mean, I think subsequently I spoke to Yoko, you know, about something else, and I raised the question of that, and I think there were still some legal issues with Elephant's memory, at least I think that's what she said at the time. Um, So she didn't seem to feel that that was imminent, and obviously it wasn't imminent, because I think I talked to her in 2014 or 15. Uh, So... didn't we ta- didn't we mention that to Gary Van Syak and he said he didn't know why it wasn't coming out? Yep. Yeah. He yeah, said that. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, it's a big the same mystery. thing. The same thing with the Elephant's Memory album on Apple. He doesn't know why that hasn't been released. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I would like to see that happen. And since there is this report from Mojo that the Imagine expanded Imagine's coming out next year, it does look like one to one's going to happen. As far as Paul is concerned, the most important thing to me is the new album. I can't remember the last time I've waited this long (laughs) for a new (laughs) McCartney album, because new came out in 2013. So this would be a five-year wait, Mm -hmm. and um, I don't think he's ever taken that long. It doesn't seem that long when you have all these remasters that he releases every single year, Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the most important thing to me. But I do believe the remastered series will continue. And most of all, and this is not a reflection of which albums I like the best, in terms of cleaning up the sound, the 70s albums that have yet to be remastered are more important because they're the muddiest of them all. I think that once you're getting into the 80s music and 90s, there isn't that much cleaning up to do. I mean, I didn't hear that big a difference in Flowers and the Dirt in terms of the remaster, as far as I'm concerned. But certainly going back to Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway, those two albums, I think I'd like to see those two come out at the same time and get similar treatments to Lux box sets. I'd love to see that come out. I'd be, quite, I'd be just as happy if London Town and Back to the Egg came out. But uh, yeah, I'd certainly love to see any of the remaining albums, certainly Press to Play, Off the Ground, like you mentioned, those albums uh, coming out with a remaster and a deluxe box set. So as far as George, I'm still waiting for Early Takes Volume 2. I don't know why it's taken this long. I think Danny has been involved so much with um, the remastering of the vinyl that came out. which He's also got his own career now. That's true. 
So, um, you know, one CD of more material, just like Early Takes Volume 1, is what I want the most because I treasure Volume 1. Hearing demos of George is just wonderful. And uh, I loved what there was on the first volume. There's got to be a treasure trove of that material spanning his whole career. If you want to keep it chronological and keep it early 70s for the next one, that's fine. But, you know, it's got to be a very tough decision to comb through the archives and put out something that you feel your father would approve when he's not here. I mean, but who knows better than Olivia and Danny where that's concerned. So that I want more than anything else as uh, more more either outtakes or demos. And for Ringo, since we know he's not going to have a new album out next year, I'd like to see his solo catalog remastered, like start with Sentimental Journey and Bukus of Blues and put them out maybe with some bonus material if there is any. I know that Bukus of Blues had uh, Coochie Coochie on it when the CD came out and the jam that was on there as well. I don't know if there's anything else. You know, the the uh, Sentimental Journey album had Stormy Weather, which Ringo recorded. But I'd like to see if there's if they can improve the sound of those uh, first two Ringo solo albums and get the ball rolling on that. I don't see them selling that well, but if you make a limited amount of copies, I'm sure that um, you know they'll be able to sell close to the amount that's made. So I'd like to see something being done. We haven't seen his his catalog remastered. Mm-hmm. You know, we've seen the vinyl come out now for Ringo and Goodnight Vienna, and also I Want to Be Santa Claus just came out on on vinyl as well as Bad Boy. But I'm also talking about CDs. I'd like to see that process start from the beginning of his solo career, make limited copies, but address those and see if you can improve the sound quality on that. Okay. So that's right. my wish list. That's your wish list. Okay. Well, here's mine. Starting with the Beatles. It's nice that uh, the White Album will be uh, out in an archival release supposedly the next year. But I have, um, for me, it's three words. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Mm-hmm. They've got to put let it be out. Uh, stop, let's, I mean, I, every, it seems like every time we have this discussion, I say let it be. And, you know, and uh, we keep thinking it might come out. I actually, We actually thought it might come out this year. But it, and it didn't. But uh, that's what I want. And seems more natural keep, for 2019 since it'll be the 50th anniversary. Maybe so. Maybe so. Uh, but uh, a lot of us aren't getting any younger. Paul mm-hmm. McCartney and Ringo Starr. Ringo Starr. Ringo. Ringo's got me beat by a few years. But um, you know, <laughs> I uh, I would love to hear this. See that before too long let me just put it that way um if if you're going by release dates then you'd have to say abbey road is the next year and then let it be is the next year right well so it's 2020 i'm at least the movie but uh, but yeah they're probably the way they're playing with the calendars now it's probably gonna end up being 2020 i hope not but anyway paul the archival releases are great but i would love to see uh paul uh paul live dvd uh, with the with the current band, uh, with the current uh, a recent uh, tour because they've been really sounding good, and uh, with the way those DVDs have been sounding, it's great to to and and looking um, because they only have they only have the one I believe in Blu-ray, and the one the one that's in Blu-ray um, can't remember the name of it now is really great. Space within us. Space within us. Yeah, that is be- that is gorgeous. That is really tremendous. I remember talking to Brian Ray about that, and he didn't even he hadn't seen it. And I said, you know, that it's amazing. It looks and it does. Uh, There's also I, I, Paul and Glastonbury. Right, but that's not the whole show. But, but Space Within mm-hmm. Us is the whole show, and okay. it's and it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I'd like to see a Paul live release in in in, um, in Blu-ray, and. The same actually would go for Ringo. Um, I'd like to see a a Ringo live release, uh, uh, although it probably wouldn't be as spectacular as Paul's would, but it would be nice. But but also with Ringo, uh, maybe it's time for an Apple Years box, like George, kind of like George did, and and get all those CDs in one set and put a few outtakes in 
uh, with each of the albums. Um, you're, I'd, you were, I'd be up for that. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about remasters. I think probably a box set would be, would be a better idea for Ringo rather than drag him out. But George, um, I, uh, I think I mentioned this in the past. It'd be great to have some archival releases, but I, I seem to think that there are concert tapes beyond the Japan show that they have. Um, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear that maybe even earlier than, you know, uh, maybe from the terrible U S tour, maybe they have some good stuff that they could do for that. But, um, that would be, I think that would be nice to have, but, uh, you know, so they can explore the, uh, the George archives, uh, John, the imagine set would be great. I, I love, I love the, uh, the idea of having the one-on-one. I think that would be fantastic. You know that that the John Lennon Live in New York City has long, long been out of print. Why that isn't in print, I have no idea. That's cr- I mean, that's crazy. It's such a great show. Ken, you were talking about the sound quality. I don't know. You know, I, I the sound quality on that is just well. All right, maybe maybe they can improve it. it I, but I, that I'd love to see that in Blu-ray. That uh-huh. would be, that would be fun to have in Blu-ray. You know, when we were talking about preserving the Beatles' legacies and we talked about George, I had discussed how much I'd like to see the 1974 tour be released audio and Mm video-wise, as well as the tour of uh, Japan as well. We did have one listener write to us saying that uh, George was not happy with the 74 tour and of singing and everything, so that's not likely to happen. And, you know, basically I said only because of historical reasons, because that was the only tour well there's the tour of japan in fact the 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 north american tour wasn't that long to begin with it was only what five weeks something like that and the tour of japan was two weeks but because there's so few live performances of george um it would be nice to have something to represent both so Mm -hmm. i definitely would like to see that but then again both olivia and danny are sensitive to how george felt about both tours so and, you know, there's one more thing I want to add, because I've been wanting to say this for a while on the show. Uh-oh. I would like to see, no, I'd like to see a live CD, a new live CD from Paul, because the last one he put out was Good Evening in New York City. But, and yeah, that was, that's what I was saying earlier about a, a new live release from Paul's current band. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think he he really needs to to do a live show. But not only that, if you follow... Even the mid-2000s, if you watch The Space Within Us, there are songs there that he did in that tour that he's never put out as an Mm -hmm. audio release. And then so many songs since then, primarily Beatles, that he hasn't released. Right. There's a lot. You know, so to represent those songs and uh, the newer material that he did live, songs like Hope for the Future, for example, the songs from Memory Almost Full, you know, uh, those songs and, and Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, which was covered during The Space Within Us, there's no audio CD mm-hmm. uh, or, or vinyl or, or digital downloads from songs from that period, from the mid-2000s to the present. I mean, there's Good Evening New York City, that's true, but um, and that does have memory almost full stuff on there, but there's a lot of songs. There's a lot of songs that haven't been released live that he's done that have never seen a release as mm-hmm. a live recording. Alan, so. you have you have any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think he should um, consider joining the ranks of some of his pals like Bruce Springsteen and uh, you know other bands like you know Fish and the Reve- and uh, Widespread Panic and various um, groups who basically make a release available for all or most of a current tour. And mm-hmm. Bruce is going back and doing archival shows, too. I mean, there are some from 78 that have turned up. And I, I have a feeling that, you know, he has someone, obviously, he has someone going through his old tapes, preparing them for a digital download kind of release in, in varying qualities. I think you can get them in FLAC or MP3. And, you know, I think Paul has this archive, too, and maybe he should consider putting it out there. Um, you know, as downloads, um, you can buy them on, you know, the websites of these various artists. Right. And he should have that, too. Yeah, the Who, I think the Who do that, too. Right. But, and there was another idea that we've talked about in past years that he he's rejected, but I still love it, is that if he would take 
one of his albums and do it for the whole tour. Right. He, we've and and he's 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 been quoted as saying he doesn't like that idea, but I really wish he would reconsider that. I think that would be a marvelous, mm-hmm. marvelous thing to do. Uh, yeah. I I really do. It would it would for one it would I mean obviously it would it would make the band work a little harder because they'd have to change more than two songs per show, but. I mean, I think it would make a mar- it would be a marvelous show, and it would, he and he would have a blast. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he could do. I mean, if you think about the wide selection of albums and and, and the music, you know, going from say, oh, Band on the Run to McCartney too. I mean, there's a quite a spread right there in, in terms of music, and you know that. I mean, it would be just incredible. I think it would be awesome. Be tough yeah. to pick one album. Which one yeah. would you have him do? Yeah, and in fact, he's done almost every song from Bad on the Run mm-hmm. live. Right, so, but he hasn't, uh, he hasn't done them in a, in a full show. Right. Um, Denny Lane has done that. You know, Denny Lane has done that. Uh, Denny Lane has done Band on the Run. Um, he's done others, too, I think, but I know he's done Band on the Run. But, he did the, uh, the first Booty Blues album. Oh, did he yeah, really? Said, yeah, yeah I, just, I saw a show where he did both that and Band on the Run. Hmm. Wow! Within the last year, yep. Wow. So th- there's something to, for Paul to think about. There's something for Ringo to think about too. I don't think Ringo would do it, but but uh, that would be, it'd be you know that'd be fun too. Anyway, I think we are just about out of time, are we not? So we're going to quickly go through, and everybody's going to tell you where you can get a hold of us, where you can yell and scream at us and say we were wrong. We got a whole bunch of comments recently about my comments about Magical Mystery Tour. Uh, that uh, I got some critical comments uh, about that, and um, they were agreeing with what you said, Ken. So, hey, whatever, you know, that's the way it is. But anyway, uh, let's go around the table and... Um, Start with Ken. Um, uh, tell everyone uh, where they can hear your Pat Denisio uh, interview and where they can get a hold of you. Okay, if you go to my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, there's a couple of clips right on the homepage. You've got to scroll all the way down to find uh, the Pat Denisio clips. That was from my first interview with him, which was when Meet the Smithereens came out. Then there's another page called More Interviews, and that one has – just about an hour of conversation with Pat. That was when the live album came out of uh, the Smithereens at the Washington Coliseum, recreating the Beatles concert there. That's on the More Interviews page of KenMichaelsRadio.com. Also, don't forget, every single week there's Beatles trivia on the website, and you can win one of nine great prizes. I'm always amazed at all the prizes that I had to give away. Chances are there's something there that you want <laughs> if you look there. It's most the most recent releases on CD, DVD or books, and uh, you can always reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. One more thing, if you ever want to listen to my show, Every Little Thing, the syndicated version of the show, you can go to a website from Germany called globaltextingchronicles.com. Click on my name. Many of my archived shows, my Beatles shows, Every Little Thing, are right there on that website. So... That's about it. Okay, Alan, your turn. Okay, you can find me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and also in the group email, which I think Steve will give you now. Which is uh, which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com, um, and you can uh, get a hold of me at my. Uh, Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, which is uh, me uh, unplugged <laughs> with both uh, uh, Beatles and, and other stuff. Or you can join my Beatles News and Information group, which is strictly Beatles, on Facebook. Um, if you want to email me, it's BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. And although it's after, it's after Christmas, we are coming up to 
uh, Davy Jones's birthday on the 30th, and I've written a book, uh, uh, an ebook uh, uh, about Davy Jones called Meet a Monkey Davy Jones, where I talk about my two interviews with Davy and also my review of the last of the show I saw on the last tour with him, Peter Tork, and Mickey Dolans. So, uh, and that's available in ebook form, and it's very inexpensive uh, on Amazon and, Be- and uh, Barnes and Noble. So, there we go. So, thank you again for listening to us. We will be back next week, uh, I think, talking about more uh, more Beatles and you know whatever we decide to come up with. Who knows? We don't even know sometimes, but uh, we have fun trying to uh, come up with uh, subjects. And if you want, if you have subjects that you'd like to recommend, um, please uh, uh, send us a note at uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail dot com. We also have a, a uh, Facebook page, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans, and there's actually another Things We Said Today page uh, for our Fab Four Radio broadcast. And I'm running out of breath. Anyway, um, so for Ken Michaels and Alan Cosen, this is Steve Marinucci saying thanks for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. And we want to wish everyone a happy and a healthy and very fab 2018.